I mean, I wrote a column in February about Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes being the first two black quarterbacks to play each other in Super Bowl. And I can think of five black quarterbacks playing a national championship game against each other since 1994, right? I mean, it's when I look at that and as far as the professional ranks versus the college ranks, I'm also asking the question, especially since you're very much keen on what the NFL is doing, do you see the sport of college football getting closer to looking like the NFL? You know what? I I, I definitely, you see it. And, and as we all find, instead of the trickle down, it's a trickle up effect because the high school systems that were greatly successful in the, the, the early 2000s, mid 2000s to where the spread systems. And now when you look at NFL teams, you see uh, 80% of these teams are running college style systems where before it was the pro style trickling down. Um, and so definitely I think you see the college game, even in some of the rules that are being applied now, uh, moving and gravitating more toward the way the NFL game is played. And, and, and you definitely, I would hope from a coaching standpoint, if you see the impact that minority quarterbacks have had in the NFL over the last two, three decades to where it, it's, it's a norm. Um, I'm hopeful that as minority coaches, we can follow that same trend because I think diversity makes it all better. And that doesn't mean diversity in just minorities or black coaches, but diversity in general typically help, helps whatever organization or whatever type of business you're in. And, and I hope that we can follow suit when you look and see the trajectory of what the black quarterback has been able to do um, at the NFL level. And there were times where guys like Charlie Ward and Marvin Graves didn't get those opportunities. They were right there on the edge of that, uh, that, that new transition to the, the minority quarterback. And I'm hopeful that as coaches, we can follow a very similar path. And there's no doubt the college game and the pro game are, are very much parallel to each other. Uh, we got this NIL thing that becomes basically, you know, I'd like to see us go to that salary cap where mm -hmm. everybody has the same money to pay a player. And we don't have these big gaps between the haves and have nots. And then let's really see what college football is all about when we're playing all with the same type of uh, restrictions or the same type of resources. Well, Coach, I'm interested in that aspect of it, too, because college football is basically up against the wall. When we're talking about NFL, I think of as a, a form of socialism. Worst team gets the first pick, uh, best team gets the last pick, right? Depending on how much money you spent, you have a cap that you got to hit up against. And let's say the Dallas Cowboys, my team, well, they got money to spend, but there is a salary cap and there is a tax for that. As you see things like that get bounced around in college football, I wonder if you come across a system of player that, or a system of pain that you find that doesn't really get under your skin as much, because that's what we're really talking about is tradition, right? right. Traditionally, this is an amateur sport. Traditionally, right. this is a sport for which you're trying to get an education. Now, it feels like you're going to get the education, but you should also get paid to play football. Yeah, and the money that's involved, and I'm part of a league that's, I think, at the forefront of college football in the Big Ten, the best of both worlds where you have strong academic institutions where the academic piece is really important to our league and making sure that the resources aren't just put into the athletic part of it, but also into the educational component of what being a student athlete should be about. But to me, I think where the problem lies with college football, there's a reason why a team like Cincinnati can go to back-to-back -to -back championship games, and they're one of the smaller markets in the NFL, probably one of the ones that have spent the least resources. But they're getting the same exact resources. They have the same opportunities of some of the bigger markets because of the alignment of being in a league. I think, to me, if you continue to study the way college football is going to go, as the, the, the people that have been able to raise money the most are the guys that have opportunities to win championships and, you know, the fan bases that are putting up the money to say, Hey, we want great players. Uh, we have seen the benefits of it uh, through this NIL thing that's out now where teams, you know, have really made big jumps and big strides before the guardrails, which I think are eventually going to come show up. And so to me, you know, we signed a billion dollar TV deal in the big 10 uh, let's take 25 million out of that and give it to every school and say, that's your salary cap. Mm -hmm. That's what you recruit with. That's how you, you manage it, how you see fit, which is very similar to what the NFL does with their salary caps. 
And then I think you'll start to see a little more parity uh, in, in terms of the way college football kind of plays itself out as the, as the season goes on. I'm curious to see how that particular aspect gets picked up. Cause I'm with you. I like that idea. You also mentioned the strength of the big 10. Uh, I've said for the last couple of months now, we're in a, uh, a time when there are two power leagues, right? The SEC and the Big Ten. And I believe the reason for that is the Big Ten got stronger with the addition of USC and UCLA coming in 2024. How are you expecting to try to overcome the travel that is going to be involved with going to LA or Pasadena and or adding extra games? And not for nothing, those football teams of recent have been pretty doggone good. How are you feeling about the challenge of playing Big Ten football, not just in 23, but 24, 25? Yeah, we're here now uh, mindset, but there's no doubt we know that they're coming. And uh, two really good programs that I think add a tremendous value to our league, which is evident in type, the type of deal that Kevin Warren, our former commissioner, was able to uh, execute before leaving to go join Chicago. And so I embrace it. Uh, you know, 2014, we were one of those programs us and Rutgers were in the same position. Um, I think the value of bringing the LA TV market to the Big Ten like we did with the DC market and Rutgers with the New York market is what makes our league uh, the best in, in the country. Uh, I think the, the educational value that they both add uh, continues along the line of the best of both worlds that the Big Ten does offer. Um, the travel things, these are all things that uh, we're in the process of studying you know, I have our football ops person, Andy Papard, who's kind of doing a project on studying the way the NFL teams that travel out west. Do we leave on a Thursday instead of leaving on a Friday uh, to get out there and the acclimation period? And I think the Big Ten is working through some of these kinks to ensure that the travel stuff that comes into play with going across country uh, doesn't add a competitive advantage or disadvantage. And, and I got a lot of faith in uh, the way the Big Ten does things, because we've always been at the forefront and uh, big thinkers anyway. So I don't think that'll have as much uh, issues from a football standpoint. Now, I'm selfish because I'm just thinking football. But, you know, obviously they've got to work through the basketball and the non-revenue sports, the Olympic sports that, you know, do have to make these travel adjustments and, and may not have. It's not a once a week deal, but two, three times a week. So. Again, um, I think the addition of both UCLA, USC has been a, a great thing for the Big Ten. And I know we're excited all here at Maryland to compete against those type of programs. Yeah, I'm curious as to how the Olympic sports are going to do this, too, because some of those are in conferences that people don't even know they're in. I believe like Colorado right. women's golf is in the Big Ten, for instance. Right. So I, right. I'm interested to see how those things play out as well, Coach. Um, in as far as your team. So I want to I want to focus in here just a second. You have been loud for at least two years now about the kind of player that Talia Tonga Valoa is. Right, took time at the lectern at the Big Ten uh, media days last year to tell everybody, "Hey, I got one of the best quarterbacks in the sport." What is it going to take for other folks to recognize that? And I was going to look at your claim here, and my goodness, this dude's got a bunch of records at Maryland now. Forgive the implication here, but I'm going to put the question to you. You pick it up. Are we going to watch Talia take the leap to Heisman contender in 23? I can tell you this. I, I'm a believer of him, and mm -hmm. I know having been around um, three guys that have been uh, had the opportunity to be in the Heisman contention, um, having been a part of Mac Jones, Jalen Hurts, and, and Tua Tungavailoa's uh, run, that he has the stuff. And, you know, what we we need to do a better job around him. Um, I've got to do a better job of continuing to develop him in all the areas necessary. But, you know, when you look at the records he's broken here at Maryland, I mean, he, he's talking you're talking about a guy that's breaking records, the guys like Boomer Esaias and uh, Neil O'Donnell, it's all these former NFL, Scott Zolak, who played here and played in the league uh, that had great success over the years. Uh, these are some longstanding records and, you know, the guy has shown up and every year uh, has helped us and he, and nobody has played a bigger role in my opinion of us, our trajectory than what the quarterback position has done here the last three seasons he's led us. And so to have him back for year four, at least right now, 
know this portal window goes till next week. So uh, you never, ever know. So I don't speak in, uh, in def definites here, but as long as he shows up here and, and leads, uh, leads the Maryland program, I think we'll have a chance to take another step, and it'll be because of the type of play he offers us as our quarterback. Well, you won back-to-back -back bowl games, right? And that's not anything to sneeze at, especially with the kind of history that Maryland has had in recent years. But I'm going to ask, Coach, what is your bar for success in 23? Well, to, to be to be better than a year ago. And to me, that's not always shown in the win or loss column. It's, it's shown in the type of program you have. It's shown the way we compete. It's shown the way that our players are being developed. I mean, you look and see that we have seven guys invited to the combine this year, which I don't ever think we've ever had this many guys. And, you know, you have 31 of the 32 NFL teams show up here for our pro day. Um, I think it speaks volumes to the way that we develop players in our program. But also, you know, I think we played last season with 22 graduates, you know, guys that are wearing the graduate patches. So uh, these guys are earning degrees. They're being developed for the next level. And I mean, that's what it's all about when you choose a school. I think obviously – NIL uh, it plays a major role and, you know, we're in one of the better markets being located in between two major cities in DC and Baltimore, that it's something that we should be able to take full advantage of and, and, and get in the mix to start uh, being compete, competing to play for championships and not just bowl eligibility. You are in a very cool place uh, for recruiting and for NIL. Like it's one of these things where when it pops off, everybody's going to notice, right? But yeah. I watched Roman Hemby pop off last year. I didn't expect Roman Hemby to be that dude. I'm still kind of sore at you, Coach, because you could have got him like 11 yards, get him to 1,000 yards, but we're going to let that go. How has he been able to help you, not just last year, but going into this spring, knowing what you got at tailback? Yeah, you know, a year ago, everybody was concerned. You know, you talked and heard a lot about the receiver room, which was uh, very much warranted in that we had guys like Rockham, Jared, uh, Deontay Banks, uh, not Deontay, Dante Demas, mm -hmm. and then Jacob Copeland, you know, all coming to play receiver in a system that has shown to be really good for receivers. And I can remember telling people that, well, listen, the young running back room is really talented and we've done a good, really good job of developing. So nobody here was really surprised by what everybody else saw mm -hmm. um, in Roman Hemby. Um, and, and like you said, I mean, he's a guy that, is smart, tough, reliable, the three things we look for. And uh, we've got some other young running backs. You saw signs of Antoine Littleton and his ability. Kobe McDonald, who a year ago was the number two guy, while we redshirted both Roman and, and, and Antoine. So, you know, and then we haven't even thrown in the true freshman, Ramon Brown, who showed up here a year ago and now looks to be really a, a, a guy that will have an opportunity to develop into a guy that plays at the next level. So, Happy with the way that running back room has, has come along and, and definitely a guy like Roman kind of sets the bar for what our culture is like. Thank you for watching the number one college football show. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video so that you don't miss any of the best college football coverage in America.